Today, I'm a postdoc from the Siemens group. Uh, I'll talk about the semiconductor application processes today. I hope you guys can understand my core English during the talk. Mm. So, to start with, I go through uh, circuit elements, fundamental circuit elements, with uh, materials based on metal and electric and semiconductor. They are divided into three based on, in terms of electrical conductivity. If the conductivity is larger than generally like 100 siemens per centimeter, it will be metal. So the metal only circuit element might be resistor and inductor. And if we integrate this metal and then dielectric together, dielectric has a conductivity which is lower than approximately 10 to the minus 8 siemens per centimeter. So if we integrate those two, we can have a capacitor structure that where we can store some charge. And for the semiconductor, it has a conductivity in between 100, I mean 10 to the minus 8 to the 100 siemens per centimeter. And we can make a famous PN diode using the semiconductor material if we dope N type or P type N type and P type atoms into the semiconductor. And finally, if we merge these three materials all together, we'll get a metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistor, which is, a, which is the most widely utilized transistor in the industry. And it's a, also a basis for the uh, integrated circuits. So I talk on the fabrication process guideline using this, based on this MOSFET device. And also we, if we tie the source and the drain junction, like here, we can make a semiconductor capacitor as well. So, yeah, this is a brief summary of the circuit elements. So, as I told you before, uh, this MOSFET device is a basis for not only the analog circuit, but also the digital circuits as well. So, this transistor size is kind of a res reference number for the industry. This is a photo taken from the Intel in 2014 for the 14 nanometer node of the transistor. So to, before getting into details, I'll point out the most critical parts in the um, fabrication process. So the transistors are, in the beginning, made, in the main, made on the silicon wafer. And in each step, different materials are deposited and they are etched after this photolithography process, which is similar to printing press. I uh, talk about detail after like 40, 40 slides after. And it is like it is very easy, it is easiest to way to understand how the structures are made by looking at from the both top and the cross section of you. Uh, the next slides will be uh, explained with top and cross sections with simplified manufacturing process. So this is our finalized inverter structure, you can see here. So typically we use P-type substrate silicon wafer for the N-time MOSFET. But I mean, this is our CMOS inverter, so we have a complementary P-MOSFET next to the MOS, which needs our N-well to control the channel. So to control the P-type channel, we need to have an N-well here. And there are uh, several alternatives, alternatives like silicon on insulator wafer or twin top structures. Uh, for the inverter to uh, actually operate, we need to know how the electrodes are tied in the silicon surfaces. It is way easier to understand the inverter operational scheme by looking at the inverse, inverse circuit. So if you recall it, the inverter looks like the two MOSFETs put, putting together, and there is an input here, and there is a supply voltage, and there is a ground, and there is an output. So so from the PMOS here, it's uh, connected to C 
supply voltage as here. And then for the MMOS, it's connected to the ground. And here, it, this one is an uh, input. Connect, I mean, this, is, uh, this is for the output. So it's how the inverter structure looks like. And to con have a contact between the metal and the semiconductor surface, we need a semiconductor surface to be highly doped, as, pos as high as possible. Because if it is like uh, very low resistive, I mean, very high resistive, there is going to be a shocky resistivity in between the two, which induces a lot of resistivity, which is very bad for the transistor operation. So we need this substrate and the uh, VDD tab to be highly doped, like here. Uh, this inverter circuit looks very simple just by putting two transistors together. But actually, there are many more steps when we actually want to make it, like here. Uh, so we need some layout using mask sets like this. This mask will be uh, six masks, like here, from end well to metal. Uh, this is a minimum number of mask sets we can we can have for making uh, inverter. Because in the state of the art industry, we need the device to be very small, like few nanometers. So there should be a finer or like extremely smaller patterns included in it. So we need a finer technology inside the inverter making process. So which means we need more masks, like 10 or 20 or even up to like 50 mask sets we need just for the inverter. So let me begin with the very beginning. So the, we start with the silicon blank wafer, like here. And we build the inverter from the bottom to the top side, so we call it bottom up process. For First, we make an N-well junction. To make the N-well junction <coughs> in the de de designed, pre-designed <coughs> location, we need a SiO2, which will block the atoms to go through the silicon area. <coughs> so we grow the silicon dioxide on top of this silicon wafer with a temperature of 900 to 1200 degrees Celsius with water or oxygen and by an ambient furnace. And then we spin coat the so-called photoresist. Photoresist is a light-sensitive organic polymer. If we expose the light, on UV light, onto this photoresist, it gets softened so that we can remove it. So using the pre-designed mask like here, we expose a certain area like this, and then shuts the light onto it, and the whole resist will be exposed to the light, and it either get softens. And then we uh, apply a liquid that is called developer, and then we remove the exposed photoresist resist area out. This is a photo taken in the Marcus Clean Room. It's a one kind of photolithographic tool called MA6, which stands for mask aligner for six inch wafer. This there is also a mask lease photolithography tool called Heidelberg. We use a exposure uh, some kind of wizard graphic unit to work as a mask here. So this this does not need mask when we actually fabricate something. And then we etch out the oxide where the four resist is exposed and removed using this hydrofluoric acid or HF. This HF is really really strong and powerful so it can melt down your skin or bones. This HF only affects the exposed forest forest is to remove the area because the other other locations they are all covered with forest which blocks the HF. 
there's also another source that can etch the silicon dioxide, type, which is a plasma. So here is a photo of a plasma glowing. It's also an equipment in the Marcus building. This is another photo from, the, uh, from another dry edge equipment. The dry edge is, what it is, is we don't use a liquid for that, so it's called dry edge. So and when, we, whereas we, when we use liquid like HF, it's called wet edge. So this is a photo, microscopic photo, taken for after the oxide has been patterned out. Since this photoresist has its job done, we strip off the remaining photoresist so that we can only have silicon dioxide below it. Using the solution called piranha, which is a mixture of sulfuric acid and hydrogen peroxide. And then we make an NL, finally, using either diffusion or ion implantation process. This diffusion equipment is generally more cheaper than ion implantation <coughs> equipment. So, uh, but the controllability is way worse compared to ion implantation. Since the most of the research institutes or um, like universities deal with very large scale, like micrometer scale, so they tend to have diffusion tools rather than ion implantation equipment. But the industry should also should have ion implantation tool to make it more finer. For the diffusion process, we place the wafer in the furnace with arsenic gas or phosphorus gas for the n-type well. For the p-type, we need boron. If we look at the periodic table, Uh, there is a group 3, there is a group 4, and 5, there is boron, silicon, phosphorus, and arsenic. So when these side elements want to uh, be bonded with silicon, the group 3 elements tend to accept electrons because they have uh, 3 electrons in the outer our ring. For the five group five elements, it tends to release their electrons. So the group three elements are called acceptor, while these group five elements are called donors. So in this case, we are using an N well here. So we are using either phosphorus or arsenic gas, and we heat it until these arsenic atoms diffuse into the exposed silicon like here. On the other hand, for the ion implantation. We blast the wafer with beams of arsenic ions, like, like this. And then these ions are blocked by the remaining silicon dioxide so that we can have our NL junction in the pre designed area. This is a photo taken from the Marcos Clearing for the diffusion uh, furnace. Uh, same thing here. And then we strip off the remaining oxide using, again, the HF. And then we are back to the bare wafer again. And the subsequent steps will be pretty much similar with the previous steps I went through. Finally, we make our gate here. Actually, we, before making our gate oxide, <coughs> we need to clean the wafer as clean as possible, because this gate oxide area is the most significant part of the transistor using a process called RCA cleaning. So after cleaning it, we deposit or oxidize the silicon surface up to the thin layer of gate oxide of approximately two nanometer. And then we chemically vapor deposit the silicon layer on top of it so that we can make a gate. We place the wafer in the furnace with silane gas which makes silicon gate. And then if we heat it, it forms many, many small crystals and then forms a polycrystalline silicon, which is called polysilicon. Because the gate is supposed to have a high, uh, high conductivity as metal, we need to heavily <coughs> dope the gate as possible so that it can be a good conductor. 
And then we have another set of gates here, mask here, to make a gate like this. And it is uh, time to make a source and drain junction. To make it, we need another oxide on top of the silicon wafer to block the unwanted area to be dotted. So we deposited oxide here again. And then we use the ND, N, source drain for n-type junction uh, mask here. And you can, you can notice that the source and drains are, should be located next to the gate here and there. But if you look at the mask here, the gate side is also open. This is because gates can block the ion coming from the implantation tool and it can, you, it can work as a mask itself. So it's called self-aligned process because it can self-align without mask. If we, so what happens if we expose this and if we uh, make it blocked for the gate area, then it will be, <coughs> there could be some misalignment issue so that the, some of the area cannot be doped in the source drain junction, so we'll have a ch high channel resistivity. We don't want that, so we normally use this self-aligned process. But for the metal, we cannot use this self-aligned process because after the self-alignment process, we need to heat it up to make the source drain junction conductive. But this heat would make this metal to be melted down, so only the polysilicon gate is available for the self-aligned process. So again, we diffuse or ion implant the source strain junction line here. And then heat it up so that you can activate the ions with silicons and then second for the second to drive in the junction so that we can make up, uh, make some some junction depths. What we, we want it. And then we strip off the remaining oxide again and so that we can have this kind of structure again. And then with the same <laughs> process, we also make a P junctions like this. So finally, we made the transistor up to this point. So since these are transistors, we call the process steps on up to now as a front end of line. And after this transistor process, we call it back end of the line. For the beginning of the back end of line, we need to make a holes for the electrode connection. For the electrodes to be connected to the silicon surface, we need first to cover the chip with thick field oxide to isolate in between the electrodes. So we deposit the field, uh, thick field oxide, and then we make a hole like here. And then <coughs> we deposit the metal using a physical vapor deposition. And spotter is one kind of that. And then we pat pattern the metal out and then make a, make a inverter. So this is a finalized inverter photo from the microscope. You can see that there is an N well in the bottom, which means there is a PMOS in the bottom and then MOS in, in the top. Okay, question. Yep. Do you need to connect the contacts to BD and ground? Like the heavily doped P plus and N plus? So your question is, why do we need to heavily dope this P plus and N plus? Actually, no, my question is, do we need to connect this area yeah, to, to VDD or ground? Yeah, uh, that's exactly from the circuit I drew. Oh, okay. Yeah, so it's, I think you recall that from the circuit. Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. Can you also explain why you said there needs to be a P plus and N plus heavily doped area? Ah, yeah. Actually, uh, so, if a low semi low resistive semiconductor is connected with the metal, it will make a shocky junction, which means 
it needs some, some voltage to turn it on. But we want it to be like ohmic, ohmic status, right? like metal, just a metal. But if we have, if we, so if it is low doped, then it will have, it will induce a really large resistivity between the electrode and the silicon. So we don't want it. So we make it P plus or N plus. Yeah. Oh, I mean, is that extra P plus next to N plus for ground? Uh, uh, that far you have a P plus next to N plus. Yeah, uh, this is for the source and drain junction. And how about P plus next? Uh, this one is for the uh, body contact. Body contact. Yeah. So body this is N plus here. So this is ground. Mm -hmm. So uh, so you want this to be connected. This drain, this drain size should be uh, the source size should be connected to the ground. Mm -hmm. So this one will be here, here, here and there uh -huh. together. Okay. And then this one will be good. Uh, yeah. Can you explain, explain why connected to that P plus area can we give you a ground? Like why not just connect it with the silicon? The way that's so, it. so it's a piece of right? Yes. So basically to make an only contact to your silicon, mm -hmm. you need to heavily do it so that it doesn't form a short key barrier like you so because it's a P-silicon, that's why you need to have a P plus token at that point so that you can make a only contact. I see, but the purpose is still connecting the transistor with the whole wafer. No, that this is to apply a body bias to your entire wafer. So your transistor is connected to you. So basically you can adjust your threshold voltage. Like body bias can be used for different reasons, but basically you are Applying a bias to your substrate is what you're doing. So you can adjust your threshold voltage or other things you do. I think, I think now I understand what your question is. So why there is P plus and N plus together, why just not N plus altogether? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, okay. So this is a this is body substrate bias, which is a reference value for tuning the VT, threshold voltage. So we need this P plus to be there to to properly connect to the body. Yeah, it's working as a body team comes. Yeah, I'll talk about more detail after this class. Okay, let me go on to the next slide. So up to this point we've gone through this transistor fabrication process. An inverter fabrication process. So uh, there is some missing point we didn't go through, which is our uh, design point. So as I mentioned earlier, we need mask sets, which is a layout for chip making. So the minimum dimension of the mask will determine how the transistor size will become. If the transistor size is as small as possible, is smaller, then the speed will be faster and it will be more cost effective and more power efficient. Uh, there is a reference value to uh, make a design, which is a feature size f. This is a distance between the source and the drain, which is gate length. This feature size improves 30% every two to three years or so. This speculation has been found by a famous man called Old Moore. So it's called Moore's Law. By improving 30%, it means the size radius of the chip it becomes 0.7 times smaller. So if we times those two together, it will be like 0.49, which is about half. So we also say the more slow, we also state the more slow as the, the number of chips become twice every two to three years. Uh, and then yeah, we can also normalize the, fe the feature size <coughs> when describing these design rules. 
by dividing the feature size to 2. And we get lambda. So we use this lambda to define many kinds of mask sets we need to have right here. So these are uh, some conservative rules to make a mask. Could be a little different from company to company, but yeah, it's pretty uh, reliable design rules that have been used for decades.